Welcome to Online Services of the Pensacola Baptist Temple. Glad you chose to worship with us even this evening. If you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to go to the book of Mark, chapter number 7. Mark, chapter number 7. We will get started there in just a moment. But before we get there, I actually want to use another verse out of 1 Corinthians about um, the natural man versus the, the Spirit of God uh, to kind of springboard off of the, the thought with the thought in mind of when God's way doesn't make sense. Listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse number 14, the Bible says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are, spirit, they are spiritually discerned. Um, you know, it's no secret among you and I that there are times when God's way doesn't make sense to us. Um, there are times whenever God does things in certain ways that we cannot comprehend why he were to do it that way. Uh, but that's what makes him God and us man. I want you to think about the story of Joshua and Jericho. Uh, God comes to Joshua and gives him the battle plans for Jericho and says, I want you to march around the city once a day for six days. And then on that seventh day, I want you to march around that city seven times until the walls fall down flat. Can you imagine Joshua giving the battle plan to those men? Uh, some of those maybe men of war that have already fought there in the wilderness one time. Uh, can you imagine what it must have felt like uh, to have given them those battle orders? He might have felt very foolish. He may have felt very inadequate. He may have felt like this probably wasn't a very good plan. But nevertheless, he trusted God and went ahead and went forward with the plan. Well, you know the end of the story, how that the walls did fall down flat and they were able to conquer Jericho simply because they trusted the Lord. Well, the Bible tells us that there are things that God does that we can't understand because his thoughts are above our thoughts. Consider Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my th thoughts than your thoughts. Which brings us to our text here in Mark chapter number 7. Uh, we're going to find here in this text that Jesus is not going to make sense, humanly speaking. Now let's begin reading in verse number 24, and we'll kind of get the understanding of what we're talking about here. The Bible says in chapter 7, verse number 24 of Mark, and from thence he arose and went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into an house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek Seraphonician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her for this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, excuse me, when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. Verse number 31, let's continue reading. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they, bese they, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears he spit and touched, the tongue, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven and sighed and saith unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened and the, and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. I'd like to preach a message entitled, When God's Way Doesn't Make Sense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the day. We're thankful for your presence. We're thankful for your perfect word. 
And as we proclaim it today, Father, I pray that many would hear it. And Father, most importantly, they would heed it and they would do as according to what it tells us to do and apply it to our lives, Lord, that we could be a changed people fit for your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, Lord, to die on the cross for our sins. I pray, Lord, that if there's one that's listening that has never received you as their personal Savior, that today would be the day they call unto you for salvation, repenting of their sins, and by faith believing that it was your work that could take them to heaven. And Father, we ask all things in the name of Jesus Christ, your precious Son. Amen. See, we see Jesus, we have seen Jesus love the unlovable. We've seen him cure the uncurable. We've seen him stop the mouths of scoffers. We've seen Jesus, uh, through a miracle, feed 5,000 men on a hillside. Multitudes of people experienced these miracles of Christ. Multitudes of people had seen Christ. Multitudes of people had experienced his kindness, his gentleness, and his goodness. We've seen the Savior, uh, Jesus, intimately deal with his disciples on a tumultuous sea. We've also seen Jesus abrade the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. But now we see Jesus in a little bit of a different perspective. Jesus has been in a public ministry, in a public mindset. He's been, he's been talking to many people, multitudes of people, talking about, to them about the kingdom of heaven. And now we see him in Mark chapter number 7 going into a house and didn't want anybody to know that he was there. Isn't that, uh, isn't that interesting? Why is the Savior being so elusive? Why, why is Jesus trying to be hid? Why is, why is it that there are times whenever you, you, Jesus seems as if he doesn't want anybody to know that he's there? Well, my friend, we understand this, that it's not because uh, of any wrongdoing on the Savior's part. Uh, because of elusiveness, we sometimes think that when people are elusive, they, they've got something to hide, but that wasn't the case with the Savior. He had a purpose to what he was doing. You know, there are times in our lives when we seem like God is not as near as he once was. It could be because of sin in our life. It could be because of lack of fellowship with Bible and, uh, and prayer. But sometimes God doesn't seem as near, and sometimes he lets that happen on purpose for us to understand how very important it is to have him close to us every day of our life. You know, there's a song that says, when you can't trace his hand, to trust his heart. And so it's obvious that we can read the Bible and we can see seasons when Jesus goes away. He departs into a secret place and, and he withdraws from the multitudes. There are times when he uh, just reveals himself to the multitudes. And there are times when he goes away and it seems as if he's hiding. And then there are times when he's got a very public ministry that he's, that he's trying to fulfill. And so sometimes when we read through the scriptures, we don't understand what exactly Jesus is doing. But I want to help you tonight uh, because there is something that this uh, Seraphonician woman is going to experience that you and I need to, uh, need to apply to our life in order for us to try to gain some understanding or try to see the Savior when we don't understand His way. He enters into this house and the Bible says that in verse number 24, He would have no man know it. Now, Jesus knows all things. He knew that he was not going to be able to be hid. He knew that eventually somebody was going to find out that he was here. He knew eventually that his, his coming would be publicized. But for a moment in time, he wanted to not tell everybody that he was here. Now, to the outside guy looking into the inside of the story, I look at that and I think, well, why is Christ being that way? I do understand that there are some interesting things about this story. Jesus is no longer in the country of Israel. He is at an, a bordering nation. And we are going to get to that during the conclusion of the message on exactly why he did that. But understand this, to the disciples and to the other people that surround him, his way did not always make sense. We also see as he's dealing with this Seraphonician woman, he begins to call them dogs. Now, I've seen Jesus very kindly and very tenderly work with, with children. We've seen Jesus very gently guide his disciples and very lovingly speak to his mother. 
And now we find this woman who, uh, for all practical purposes, is just seeking healing for her daughter. And it seems like Jesus is very harsh with her through his words. And if we were just to take this one story and we were to pull it out of the entire context and, and we were just to try to uh, focus on just this one story or just this one statement of the Savior, we would draw a conclusion that he did not care for this Greek Seraphonician woman nor her daughter. But that's not at all the case. This is the same Jesus that said, Suffer the little children to come unto me who spoke kindly to others and gently touched the lepers and lovingly taught the multitudes and compassionately reached out to take Peter's hand before sinking beneath the tempest and warmly took the lunch of a kind lad. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the 5,000. There are just some things that I don't understand. But you know, this woman, this Greek Seraphonician woman with a sick daughter, has four things that she does in her life that I think will help you and I get through seasons when we don't understand what God is doing. I mean, right now, can, can I be honest with you? I don't exactly understand why God has brought uh, our nation into a pandemic like he's done. I, I don't understand everything that's involved with that. I believe partly it could be because of the judgment on America because we've become such a wicked nation. But I don't understand everything. Uh, I don't understand why God is allowing churches to close their doors right now when the gospel is more needed than ever. I don't always understand, but here are some things that we can do during the times we don't understand to get us through. Number one, notice in verse number 26, if you would, the hunt for Jesus. The hunt for Jesus. Verse number 26 says this, The woman was a Greek Seraphonician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Now this woman, I don't know much about her other than what we've just read, but I do know this, that she was not an Israelite. She was not somebody that had a right to speak to the Messiah. She was not somebody that had the, a right to expect a Messiah. She was not someone that probably knew a lot about the Messiah. No doubt that rumors had passed through the, through the neighboring nation about who this Jesus was and what he had done and how his miracles had affected others. And, and so she came to him looking for him, hunting for him, beseeching him that he would come and would take his, her daughter and to heal him, heal her. Although Jesus didn't want to be found, there was somebody looking for Jesus. And, and God may seem distant to you today, and, and you just need to make a commitment that even though he seems distant, my friend, he's only a prayer away, and, and make the commitment that you and I are going to hunt for Jesus. It doesn't matter how we're going to get there. We're just going to hunt for Jesus. It doesn't matter how early we have to wake up. Let's hunt for Jesus. Doesn't matter how late we have to stay up. Let's hunt for Jesus. Doesn't matter how many pages of Scripture I have to read in the morning. I'm going to hunt for Jesus. Doesn't matter how long I stay on my knees in prayer. I'm going to hunt for Jesus. Because my friend, Jesus was not just a solution to this woman's problem. Jesus was the only solution to this woman's problem. And my friend, until you and I get to the point where we're desperate for Jesus, where we're desperate to see him work in our life, my friend, oftentimes he will seem distant and we will not see him work the way he wants to work. Can I ask you a personal question? Are you desperate to see Jesus work in your behalf? Are you desperate to see him work through your financial struggles? Are you desperate to see him work through your children's struggles? Are you desperate to see him work through your marriage struggles? Are you desperate to see him work through our nation's struggles? Are you desperate to see him work in our church struggles? Until we get to that point, my friend, you and I will not see Jesus work like he wants to work. This woman got wind that Jesus was near and she began to hunt. She began to beseech. She began to beg. She began to cry out, for this was her only hope. This was the only hope the woman had for her daughter to be healed. Number two, not only hunt for Jesus, number two, we need to humble ourselves. In verse number 25, it says, A certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. And notice this next statement it says, and came and fell at his feet. 
Now, I'm not exactly sure what I would do if Jesus were to walk up to me even right now. I, I just know the way people responded to him in Scripture. People that were self-righteous stood up and boldly disputed with him. But those who were seeking help and seeking healing and seeking comfort very often fell down at his feet. A sign of humility. A sign of saying, you are over me. You are a Lord. You are a master. You are important. And I, I'm, I'm beseeching you. I'm begging you. I'm humbling myself. She fell down at his feet. She didn't march up to Jesus and demand, you fix my daughter's problem immediately. Now, Hebrews actually tells us that we have the ability to go into the throne room of grace with boldness. And we can march in that room with boldness and declare our needs and our petitions to an almighty God. And I thank God for that. But my friend, when you and I start believing that we deserve to be heard by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when you and I think we, that we deserve to have our prayers answered, when you and I think that we deserve to see God work in our midst, we are sadly mistaken and we need revival in our own life. This woman understood that she didn't deserve a, time, a second with Jesus. She didn't deserve his time. She didn't deserve his energy. She didn't deserve his power. All she really deserved was to be reproved and sent on her way. But she didn't want, she, she had nothing to lose. Her daughter had been sick a long time. She had nothing to lose. She was already at her wit's end. She had nothing to lose. She was already uh, sick for her daughter to be healed, desperate. She had nothing to lose. And so she humbles herself. Interestingly enough about that, Jesus typically, when he saw that type of humility, would go ahead and heal the person's need or the person's son, daughter, whatever the case was. But in this story, because he wasn't in Israel, he handled it a little bit differently. And this is the part that really doesn't make sense to the outsider's view. Jesus simply talks to the woman and says this, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. What was Jesus talking about? Jesus was talking about the message of salvation, the good news, the healing, the power, the ability to see miracles happen. And he said, right now, my priority is in Israel. I came unto my own. I'm coming to Israel as their Messiah. And I right now am dealing with the children. And it, it should never be that the Messiah should come to the children, but instead of giving the children what they need to give all of his power, all of his attention, all of his miracles, all of his goodness, all of his glory, all of his attributes to the other surrounding nations, because yet Israel was still and is still the apple of God's eye. And he said, it's not right, it's not appropriate for me, a Messiah of Israel, to come and to give you what Israel is, is needing so badly. Now, had Jesus said that to me, Jesus would have been completely right because he is, he's always right. But notice the woman's comment. And here is how we see her humility. We, we don't understand exactly exactly what she was thinking, but we see what she said and it really helps us to understand what she meant by it. Look at verse number 28. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. She didn't, she didn't address him in any other way. She didn't, she didn't back up from her position at his feet and stand up and go, okay, yeah, you know what, you're right, and walk away. As a matter of fact, she further submits herself to him and calls him Lord, a master. You have the authority over me. We see this woman was hunting for Jesus. We see that she humbled herself. But third of all, we see that she had faith. She had faith. As we continue reading her statement here, she says, yes, Lord. And then she says this, yet the dogs under the table 
eat of the children's crumbs. She said, Jesus, I'm not expecting you to forsake Israel. I'm not expecting you to move here into my city. I'm not expecting you to do this mass revival and miracle working thing. I just need one miracle, one small miracle, one little bit of healing for my little girl. She placed her faith in the fact that Jesus was the one who could heal her daughter. See, she did a, she, she went on an all out hunt. When she finally found him, she humbled herself. But then when the day was over, she had faith in what G, who Jesus was and what he could do. She says, Lord, I just want a little bit of your power. I just want a little bit of your glory. I just want a little bit of a miracle. And it's really not even a selfish motive, Lord. It's not for me. It's not so that I can have peace of mind. It's not so that I can go to sleep at night. No, it's for my little girl that's at home with a devil and I want her to be healed. And Jesus responded in a, a very interesting way. He says, for this saying... Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say because of your faith? Now, obviously, we understand she had faith because she, she called him Lord, but also because of what she was asking him to do. She had the faith. But he said because of this saying, because of what you said. See, Jesus is not interested in, in our lip service. He's, he's not saying that it's just because of what she said. She's say, he's saying this, that because of what was on the inside was expressed in what you said. What you really felt was expressed in what you said. And, and it's how it came out because of that. Because of what's on the inside of you, that faith that you have, that humility that you have, I'm going to heal your daughter. He says this, for this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. Now let me ask you this, on another note of having faith. If that woman had just stayed at the feet of Jesus after he had said this, would she really have shown her faith? See, here, here's what I'm trying to get at. Oftentimes we say, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need you to do this. But we constantly, constantly are begging and praying instead of just walking and knowing and resting in what God has already promised he would do. My friend, you and I have been given an assurance through his word that he would perform the things that he said he was going to do. Case in point is your salvation. You don't have to wake up every morning praying to be saved, my friend. If you've called out on God Almighty for salvation, you've turned from your sins unto the Savior. My friend, you're saved from now until eternity to come and you don't have to worry about it. It's not something that you have to beg God for daily. You just have to live in the faith that God has saved you. There are other things that we could talk about. Just walking and knowing that you and I have been given the victory over sin. You and I do not have to wake up every morning and pray that God would give you victory over sin. And then every second of every day, God, give me victory over sin. No, you walk in the reality that God has done everything that had to be done in order to save you, but also to sanctify you and to bring you unto himself and make you more like Jesus Christ. Now we have to walk in it. Now we have to forsake those sins and just do what Christ said to do. She had the faith to get up from his feet and to walk home. What do you think the walk home was like? I wonder if the walk home was with a little bit of anxiety. I wonder what I'm going to find when I get home. Jesus told me to go home. I know who they say he is. I've seen some of the things he's done. I've heard of some of the things he's done. I, but I've never experienced, I wonder what I'm going to find when I get home. Maybe she was walking with friends and the friends didn't believe in Jesus and didn't believe what he said and said, you know, that it's, not, it's just going to be the same when you get home. And maybe deep down inside somewhere she said, you know, no, I think this time is different. You know, I went to, I went to this person and they said it was going to be all right, but it wasn't all right. 
I went to this person, and they said it was going to be all right, but it wasn't going to be all right. I went to this doctor, I went to this psychiatrist, I went to this psychologist, I went to this pharmacist, and I tried to get everything right, but it was never right. But since I met Jesus, I know everything's going to be all right. She walks home, and she finds her daughter in bed. And maybe she, and this is just total speculation, but maybe she walks in the door and she says, Hey, sweetie. And with the first, first kind words she ever heard her daughter speak back to her was, Hey, Mom. Wow, I feel different. Mom walks over and for the first time in maybe years, she was able to actually touch her daughter. Maybe for the first time in years, she was able to kiss her on the brow. Maybe for the first time in a long time she had ever been able to see God's power work in her life. But it made a difference. Because you know what? She didn't understand that Jesus was making himself elusive. And she didn't understand why he was being so very abrupt in his speech. But my friend, she still was on a hunt for Jesus. And she still humbled herself. And she still had faith in what he could do and what only he could do. And then last of all, This is not in the text, but I just cannot help but believe. I cannot help but believe that this woman didn't honor him with praise. You say, why do you believe that? Well, if you continue reading the story in verse number 31, it says, And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. I want you to get this picture. He puts his fingers in his ears. He spit. Doesn't tell us where he spit. He may have spit on the ground. Maybe he spit on his fingers. Maybe, maybe he spit in the man's face. I'm not sure where he spit, but he spit. And he touched the man's tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said this word in uh, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loose, and he spake plain. And look at what it says here. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. Christ is doing miracles in this foreign country and he's telling them, hey, don't tell anybody. But my friend, when your daughter had a devil and now she's healed and, and when you were, you were deaf and you couldn't speak and now you, are, you can hear and you can speak, my friend, you can't contain what God has done for you. It's just an overflowing of how good God has been. And my friend, you and I have been saved from a devil's hell and we've been snatched out of an eternity without Christ and put our feet on a solid rock and now we're on our way to heaven and, and we have hope in our back pocket and, and you and I have joy in our soul and it ought to just spill out all over the place. It don't matter if I'm at Walmart, it ought to spill out. It don't matter if I'm at the gas station, it ought to spill out. Hey, it ought to spill out in our homes and it most definitely ought to spill out in our churches. It ought to spill out everywhere we are saying Jesus is wonderful. His name is to be praised. Because Christ changed our life. You know, Jesus sometimes acted in strange ways and we never have the solution to why he did that. But you know, over in the book of Matthew, we actually find why he told people not to tell other people. Why he was trying to hide himself. In Israel, when he was trying to hide himself, the truth was this, that his hour was not yet come, and he did not want to get too popular too quickly because he had to, he had to prove that he was going to live a perfect and sinless life before they crucified him. He had miracles that he had to accomplish in order to fulfill prophecy before they could crucify him in order to be proven as the Messiah. So when he was in Israel, that's why he did it. But why was it this way when he was in other nations? Over in Matthew chapter number 11, number, uh, verse number 21, Jesus says that if the mighty works would have been done in these other places, they would have repented a long time ago. 
See, Jesus came to Israel and presented himself as Messiah, as the Word with flesh, and we see him as he goes in and he, he tries to portray himself as God the Son, and he is God the Son, and they took him and they crucified him. Well, it says about these other nations that if he were to have gone to them, they would have repented and turned from their sins. And he would have become so popular in these other nations that they would have not allowed him to go to the cross. And my friend, Jesus' love toward you and I is so deep and it's so powerful that he did not want to go and do all these miracles in these other countries and, and suffer uh, himself to sidetrack the cross because the cross is the only way of salvation for the world. And so he went and he showed little glimpses of his glory and, and who he was and, and showed salvation to the other nations just simply because he cared. But he couldn't let it get too out of hand. Are you listening to me? Because he still had to go to the cross. And my friend, if you're listening right now and there's never been a time in your life where you've received Jesus as your personal Savior, you listen to me and you listen to me well. Jesus Christ is calling to you even right now saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he wants to bring salvation to your house. You say, well, preacher, how do I do that? It's as simple as calling unto him for salvation. Understanding that you're a sinner and can't save yourself and call out to him for salvation. You see, he lived a perfect life, but then he died on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later he rose up from the grave, proving he had no sin of his own. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and that the Father was pleased with his sacrifice. And now if you and I will believe in what he's done, you and I can have salvation through him, and we can go to heaven when we die. But we can also enjoy His presence here on this earth because after we get saved, His Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and He allows us to live in liberty uh, within the realm of the Bible. It's an amazing life to live. See, Christ didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom just yet. He came so that He could be crucified and die for the sins of the whole world. Every boy, woman... Every boy, girl, man, woman, everybody on planet earth benefits from the death of Jesus Christ when they believe in his death, burial, and resurrection for the payment for their sins. But maybe you've already been saved and, and this sermon is for you. You say, I don't, I don't know why God is forcing me to an early retirement. I don't know why God is pushing me in this specific direction. I don't understand why my child has passed away. I don't understand why my, my spouse has left me. I don't understand why things are going on in my life the way they are. Can I help you to understand these things? If you will, number one, hunt for Jesus. You will find him. Number two, if you will humble yourself. The Bible says a broken and contrite spirit he will not refuse. Number three, if you will have faith that he knows what he's doing. And last of all, be sure to honor him with your praise. My friend, you may not always understand what he's doing, but it will help you to get through the difficult times when God's way doesn't make sense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would please bless it. I pray for those that are listening, God, that you would deal with them in a very intimate way. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching our services tonight. Hope they've been a blessing. If they have, why don't you comment, share, like it, do something, and uh, let your friends know about this YouTube page. And if you'd like to come join us for services, we have a live Sunday morning service at 1045 and a Wednesday evening service at 7 o'clock. Hope to see you there. Thank you for listening.